Uh, let me first uh, thank the uh, organizers uh, for the, the conference for giving me the honor to be a speaker here at, uh, as a keynote speaker, actually. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy having to follow a French astronaut who knows Tom Cruise and Usain Bolt and then <laughs> a Nobel Prize winner, but here I am. So I will do my best to uh, entertain and inform you uh, in this particular area. Uh, my thanks go to Professor Vigny for his dream of Le Studium, because if we had not had the dream and the implementation of it, none of us would be here in this room today. And my thanks to Professor, or to Dr. Ginot, to Sophie, to Aurelien, and the entire Le Studium team uh, for handling things so well in terms of my professorship with Le Studium. Uh, but I also would like to make another uh, thank you, and that is a thank you to all of the people who have been downstairs checking us in in the morning, getting here well before we get here, staying here well after we leave. We may be sitting there listening to the jazz music, uh, but they're cleaning up all the cheese and wine and everything else. So I think as a uh, conference, we should give them a round of applause. <laughs> so uh, when, I, when I thought about my talk today, I decided that um, I really didn't want to go deeply into the chemistry. I'm sure... 75% of the audience is not, I don't want to say interested in, but um, is not interested in hearing the details of the chemistry. What I decided I would do for that reason is give something which really focuses on the studium and not on the work that my group has done. But I'm going to use that work that my group has done as a way to take us on a pathway to think about science. Um, so, to my chemistry colleagues out there who are hoping to hear a lot of chemistry, I apologize. You will see molecules, um, and I will occasionally talk about different things that they can do. Um, but, as I say, I have this broader vision for the presentation. To my humanists friends, new ones that I have met, I apologize because there will be chemistry in the talk. <laughs> and I will do my best to be as pedagogic and clear as Jean-Pierre Sauvage was yesterday, but that's a hard, that's a hard act uh, to follow. So, um, yes, with all of that, the other thing that I did want to mention before I get too far along is a comment that Gordon made in his presentation uh, when talking about Le Studium. When I went to the University of Michigan in 1984 as an assistant professor, I went there with lots of hopes and dreams. One of them was that since I was at one of the great public universities in the United States with tremendous uh, breadth of, of knowledge across every discipline from engineering and medicine to uh, old English language and psychology, that I would be able to go and listen to presentations, maybe even occasionally sit in on a course and learn from all of my colleagues. Well, as Kurt Vonnegut said in Cat's Cradle, you know, the Bokaninists are busy, busy, busy. We are all so busy trying to keep our programs going, trying to make our fame, all the different things that, that drive us in, in this business. And over those years, I never really had the opportunity to do it. Um, we've talked about how the studium is unique. To me, it is the only time um, in my career where I have been in a situation where I feel as if I really get that stimulation. So thank you. Um, you know, seeing yesterday, for example, uh, talks about <laughs> people looking at paintings before they get their heads cut off. I mean, that's not something a chemist normally <laughs> sees, right? And uh, and it's good, it's good for the soul to be able to see things like this and all the other work that I've heard this week. 
So with, with that as a bit of an introduction, what I'd like to do, I, I seem to have lost where I put the uh, actual clicker here. I'll find it in one of my pockets one of these days. Do you, do I, do I have a laser pointer? I don't know, I don't see it here. Who stole the pointer? Probably me. <laughs> but anyway, I will, I will, I will just talk. It, it was here this morning. We'll take out my wallet and we'll take out my cell phone. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I told you I stole it. <laughs> so um, first, the next thing I need to do is to thank uh, my colleagues here in uh, Orléans. Uh, Stefan Petu, that you see, see here, and uh, Svetlana Yeliseva, who unfortunately could not be here because of an emergency that came up uh, just before the conference. And of course, my lovely and wonderful wife, uh, who is part of the Studium Consortium that you see here that was in two, started in 2018, chaired by Svetlana, and now uh, associated with the visit that we have uh, for the next few years with the Studium. So, um, the title of the talk is Linear versus Nonlinear Science. And if you were to go through and look back, you see pictures of plague doctors. Most of them were charlatans and quacks. But they would wear, for example, these masks, and that's something that to modern day people is something we envision of that particular field uh, or that time. But, you know, uh, the plague goes back to uh, basically uh, the, the prehistory time. Uh, but it hit Europe particularly hard in the 1340s and 50s. And you can go through the rest of the different uh, points that I've mentioned here. Uh, 19, or 1894, Yersinia pestis was identified as the pathogen. Soon after, fleas were identified as what carried uh, this particular uh, bacterium. In the 30s and 40s, the first drugs uh, came out that were able to, uh, to treat this. And uh, today, there are additional ones from aminoglycosides all the way through things like the fluoroquinolones that have been able to drop the number of deaths from this from the literally 25 million in the 14th century down to maybe a few hundred a year. And the reason that it's only, a, it is even a, a few a year is because most people are not diagnosed with the plague soon enough to get them the medication. If they can get the medication, they can be, uh, they can be cured of this disease. So this is how, how we think about things, that this progress in science and medicine has gone linearly through these 700 years. Now, if you go through and you look at the most recent time, this is my plague mask uh, that I've been wearing for whatever. You notice it's a modern style uh, as opposed to the more neo-Gothic version that was used <laughs> many years ago. Um, mine was modified by the fact that my head is so big that the one strap broke. But um, you can see here that, that you know, we still use some of the same approaches. And quite frankly, from some of the studies that are coming out right now, they may be equally effective as the plague masks were. But that's a, st a political statement, so I'll stay away from that. What I will say is that if we look at the progress for this, you can say, well, SARS, the first uh, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and MERS, the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, uh, occurred about 20 years ago, but then in late 2019, we know the story. And there were all of these different uh, milestones, if you will, including vaccines becoming available uh, in the late uh, 2020s uh, that were allowed to, uh, to treat this, uh, this uh, deadly disease, which has caused the death of over 6 million people uh, on our planet. Uh, and probably in 50 years, when people write about this, you'll see a timeline that's like that. Now, one of the things that I heard the other day was this discussion about people having a lack of confidence in science. And one of the reasons why I think today people have a lack of confidence in science is that scientists try very, very hard to present that what we have done is through 
rigorous uh, experiments, double blind tests, all of these different things. And when we say something, we know it, all right? And people have faith that we know it because we do these experiments. And that's what gets presented to the public. Well, the truth of the matter is, the public had an opportunity to see a little bit how science worked in the last two years. And it's like making sausage. One person comes up with data that says this, another person comes up with data that says that, and they go back and forth and they argue about it. Then some big change happens over here, and they go and work over there, and then that comes back over here. But if you're used to hearing that the scientists know all when they tell you something, and then you start hearing, well, sometimes this is right, and then, well, wait a second, you said six months ago it was that, and now you're saying this. And what happens is people lose faith. That's one of the main reasons why society right now is having some issues. And so I think it's important for us to, to recognize and admit to the fact that science, is, in fact, is not something that goes in this linear pattern that you'll see in textbooks, but in fact bounces around. And what your intention was that you wanted to do at the beginning may not be the result you get at the end. So I'm going to tell the story in a very personal way, um, going through my life as a scientist. Here I have a photograph of my father, who is a commercial artist and a fine artist. This is a uh, showing of one of his works at a, at a gallery uh, in Ann Arbor. And he had a disease which is known as thalassemia, but he had the thalassemia minor form. So genetics, I have to go now into some science, you have two different genes, one that comes from your mother, one that comes from your father, that gives you particular traits. Thalassemia is a disease that developed uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, my father's grandparents came from Sicily um, to uh, basically avert the bad effects of malaria. It changed the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin couldn't be eaten by the plasmodium uh, parasite. And so people who had one gene for this particular hemoglobin would be able to survive a malarial infection. Those people who did not have that gene were far more susceptible and likely to die. But those people who had two genes, both of the, if you will, bad genes, would die by the time they were three to five. They would be mentally retarded, all sorts of bone misstructure, et cetera. And then people figured out how to treat this. The way that you treat it is you give blood transfusions because those blood transfusions come from people with the normal hemoglobin. And so those individuals could now have normal hemoglobin and develop normally, and you wouldn't know that they were any different than anyone else. The problem is that when you give all those blood transfusions, each of those bags of blood, each liter, contains a lot of iron. And that iron, after a while, accumulates. And it precipitates in the heart. It ends up filling the bloodstream so they can get bacterial infections and heart attacks. So if you do not take the iron out of them, they will die typically by the time that they're 12 years old. So to get around that problem, what uh, individuals do is give this medication here, which is sold as Desferol, this particular molecule is infused under the skin of a child um, or an adult as they get older. They have to do this about three to four times a week for 11 to 12 hours each day through this so-called subcutaneous infusion. Uh, it's not pleasant, and you can imagine that usually, or often, uh, people who have this by the time they're in their early 20s say, forget it, I'm not going to do it anymore, and then they die afterwards. So my interest here was, one, my father it had the, the trait, which he lived to 96 and is, was healthier at 95 than I am today. But the, um, the people who have the full disease uh, they have problems. And so I worked with this fellow, Ken Raymond, at UC Berkeley to try to develop molecules like this that were very, very good at binding iron so that we could take the iron out of uh, these individuals. Okay, and so these were called siderophores. 
Um, again, it's not really critical here. I'm going to go back to what Jean-Pierre said yesterday. We in inorganic chemistry will talk about these different atoms, the combined metals. This particular molecule, a hydroxamic acid, is what is known as a chelating agent, and in particular a bidentate, so bi two, dent teeth, two teeth, there's one tooth, there's the other tooth, and you put a metal here and you bite into the metal. And so then you have that ring structure. And you can see that there are others of these types of ligands that can be used, but we're going to use the hydroxamic acid today. Okay, now let's move forward about three years. I've taken my job at the University of Michigan. And in the 1980s in the, uh, in the United States, if you were an assistant professor of chemistry, you were not allowed to do anything related to what your PhD work was or to what your postdoc work was. You had to show that you were intellectually independent. And so I came up with some other ideas. One of them was to work on this particular mushroom called Amanita muscaria, or fly agaric in English. It is a poisonous mushroom. People actually die of this each year, eating it, uh, because it also has some hallucinogens in it, and they think, well, you know, that'll work. But what intrigued me about it was that it had this molecule, amavidin, that you can see the structure here. And this molecule binds vanadium. Now, I suspect everyone in the room is, is uh, certainly aware of iron and that iron is in your body. But most people don't know that vanadium can be in your body. In fact, vanadium can regulate your blood sugar as well as a lot of the modern uh, treatments for type 2 diabetes. But as an aside, I, back in 1984, nobody knew anything about vanadium in biology. And so I said, well, you know, I'm an assistant professor. This is a great area. It's an, it's an open source for me to do work. And so I had to figure out how this molecule worked. And one of the things that I thought was interesting was it had this so-called hydroxyl amine type structure here. That is a nitrogen, which is an amine, and this OH group we call a hydroxyl. The main area, though, that uh, I worked in for 25 years was in photosynthesis. And uh, a lot of different people have used the Earth as a, as a way of moving forward their talk. When you look at the Earth, there are a few things that you think, can think about. Vast amount of water, an atmosphere, which we found was very, very thin, that contains dioxygen or oxygen gas, and of course, there's life. And what may not have been mentioned in, so far in this conference is that the reason why we have the oxygen in our atmosphere is because of life. If you didn't have algae, if you didn't have plants, you would not have oxygen in the atmosphere. 99.3% of the oxygen that's on the planet has come from life through photosynthetic reactions. We ta talk today about climate change, but there was no greater ecological disaster to hit the earth than when photosynthetic bacteria went from just taking light in and reducing minerals to actually making oxygen because it changed the earth completely and most forms of life became extinct and only those that could use oxygen survived. But of course for us that was great because organisms that can use oxygen can actually move and do things and whatever else because there's a lot more energy in that. And so what I was curious about was how did the chemical reaction that was associated with this oxygen conversion, or water conversion to oxygen occur. And it occurs in something called uh, the Photosystem II Reaction Center, which is in a particular part of the plant called the thylakoid. And uh, in particular, what it does is the reaction that you see here. Two water molecules are converted into oxygen, and four protons and four electrons are released. Jean-Pierre Sauvage talked about splitting water yesterday. <laughs> But when he did, he talked about making oxygen and hydrogen gas. Okay, this would, if you took the four protons and the four electrons, put them together, you would get what we call two equivalents or two molecules of hydrogen gas. And of course, we want that because you burn hydrogen gas in the presence of oxygen, you just go backwards and you make water. And you can't think of a much greener reaction 
in terms of generating energy, and this is one of the most energetic reactions you can get. So uh, that's really good, but plants don't care about that. What plants care about are the protons and the electrons. They take the electrons, and you saw Jean-Pierre yesterday put the, uh, the ATP synthase in, and he showed how it ratcheted around, just went in a circle. And that's every time a proton went through the membrane, it moved once, and then it moved again, and then it moved again. Every three times, it makes that molecule ATP that he said we generated in such tremendous amounts. So this, we call this the oxygen evolving complex because we breathe oxygen and do this reaction in the other direction. That's respiration. But in uh, the light reactions of photosynthesis, this generates oxygen. But this is a byproduct. It's a waste product. It just got thrown out into the atmosphere and there was no EPA or any other agency around to say you can't throw oxygen into the atmosphere. And so it did that. What it cared about were protons and electrons. So how is this made? Well, if you look at this particular diagram back in the late 1980s, uh, the model that had come out of Berkeley, which was the best model for the structure of this, said that there were four manganese atoms, and those manganese atoms were associated as two together and two together. When you have two together, we call that a dimer. When you put these two together, that's a dimer. And so it was called the dimer of dimers model. And the idea was that the manganese could become very energetic by the light reactions and eventually convert the water molecules that bound first to hydrogen peroxide and then eventually to dioxygen. And when the dioxygen left, that would lower the energy of this system and it would come back to here and the whole process would happen again. So knowing that, my group went through as a synthetic inorganic chemist and made all of these different molecules and where you see the green here, the lavender or whatever other color we have over here, those are what are called oxidation states of the metal. Meaning that yesterday Jean-Pierre talked about copper one and copper two. As you have different charges on the metal, that means that you have different numbers of electrons on the same element. And so in this particular case, we were interested in this because as the process of photosynthesis occurred, the manganese would start in what is called a low oxidation state, meaning very small numbers, manganese two and three, going all the way up to very high oxidation states. And we wanted to know what the physical properties of these types of molecules would be. So at around this time, it was shown that hydroxylamine was uh, what is known as an inhibitor. So if you gave this enzyme hydroxylamine, instead of making oxygen, it ended up just getting stuck. And so what we were interested in was how did it get stuck? But the problem is hydroxylamine in itself is not a very stable molecule. So there's no way that you can make manganese compounds that have just hydroxylamine sticking on them. So it was 1988, about this time, I had just gotten promoted, just gotten tenure, and I said, well, the hell with it to my colleagues. I don't care whether you want me to do something different. I know a way to make a molecule that has hydroxylamine with it, and that is to take those hydroxamates I used in graduate school, which have this N and O, and use this as a way to bind to the metals, whether it be manganese or vanadium. And if I got really lucky, maybe this other oxygen here would bind and make it more stable. And so this was a way for us to get into this particular chemistry. And so I went into the lab. This is back in the days when I actually mixed chemicals, uh, clearly a very unsafe period. So um, it's good, <laughs> good to know that the safety in chemistry has gotten better over the years as I've gotten out of the lab. But in, whoops, in any case, what one sees is this molecule. And it turned out I was really excited when we got this molecule because it had, it was a really rare example of a particular form of vanadium. Again, not important today. And it had three vanadiums, one here, one here, one here. And again, that was extremely rare at that particular time. And so I thought, wow, this is great. This is gonna be a Jack's paper just for these different types of things. 
But then I looked at it a little bit longer. And we're in France, so we should be thinking about French scientists and their comments. And uh, in English, we would say chance favors only the prepared mind. And um, maybe I'm giving myself too much of a compliment, but as I thought about this molecule, I went, remembered back to when I was in an undergraduate. And it turns out that if you look at this molecule, it turns out there's an oxygen here, here, and here. And then there are two atoms that link each of those oxygens. They're there and they're there. And at that point I said, gee, that looks a lot like a molecule I had seen called a crown ether. But it's not a crown ether because it has no carbon in the ring. So we'll call this metallocrowns. It is the inorganic analog of crown ethers, a completely new way of stitching together molecules. So I said, wow, that's cool. And the reason my mind was prepared was because I took organic chemistry in UCLA in 1975 from someone who would be a future uh, Nobel Prize winner, Donald Cram, and he taught me all about these crown ethers. And here you see those four oxygens with the two carbons going across. So if you replace those two carbons with vanadium and nitrogen or manganese and nitrogen, suddenly you're in a position where you can make rings that are like this, and these are called metallomacrocycles. And that, those were the first metallomacrocycles. So in the field of chemistry, now there's probably two, three, four thousand papers on metallocrowns, but there are probably 50,000 papers on metallomacrocycles. So these became molecular squares, all sorts of things that pe the chemists in here have heard about, all came after we made these types of molecules. Whoops. So, I went to Michigan. I had to have independent projects. But at some point, PH, my, my PhD research came in. Those things happened, and serendipity. And I will call this serendipity in the sense of physical serendipity. In other words, I got some crystals. I got a result that I wasn't expecting, but it was a really great result, OK? And that happened, and that changed that portion of my career. So I was standing over here, and all of a sudden, I'm hanging out over here with Sophie. Because this is supramolecular chemistry. This is not bioinorganic chemistry. This is completely different. Right? And yet here I am doing something else at that time. And so I sent this off to the reviewers at JAX, and I got my first review back. And they said, this is just a, an artifact. Sorry, reject that paper. The next person, who was even worse, said, how could such a promising young scientist go through and succumb to selling snake oil? Snake oil, for those of you who don't know, is what people would go around in the wild west of, of the United States in the 1900s or 1800s. And they would say, this will cure your cancer. This will cure your hemorrhoids. This will cure everything. And it cured nothing. OK? So this is what the person was accusing me of having. So they basically all said, reject. And I ended up publishing the paper not in JAX, but in, a, we'll say, a more obscure journal. OK. But at the same time that I got this rejection from this very good journal, I uh, had a student, Young Soo Law, who is now in Korea as a professor, very well-known professor there. Um, he made this molecule because we were trying to do the photosynthesis stuff, and now it has manganese. And you'll notice this has a manganese, uh, a nitrogen, an oxygen, a manganese, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera, going all the way around here. It turns out now it's got a metal in the center. And so this was what would be called a 12 metallocrown 4 with the manganese that was bound. So I sent it back to Jax, and guess what? <laughs> they sent it to the same reviewer. <laughs> they keep overselling this trivial coordination chemistry. However, fortunately, I got a good reviewer. <laughs> and, and when Al read the paper, he basically went through and said, yeah, this is a great way to throw molecules together. And the editor of the journal called me up, and he said, well, what, do you, what should I do? And I said, well, JAX is the premier journal in our field. If you can't publish a brand new way of doing bond connectivity in the most important journal in chemistry, what is the journal there for? 
So he said, okay, and we published it, and it came out in, in Jax after that. And while we were doing this, before the paper came out, we were now able to predict another one. And here we have iron in the center and three irons around the outside. And this is that nine metallic round three that has an iron that is in the center. Guess what? <laughs> they sent it to that same person because this person knew that we had already published the other work. I mean, it hadn't even appeared yet. And this person was saying, but notice the change. Now I don't see the urgency because they've already published this. So it went from being something that was a trivial artifact to something that was everybody knew before the first paper was ever published. <laughs> this is what happens in science, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. But fortunately, I had another reviewer. Al didn't get it this time, Linus did. And he said, wow, this is really great. In particular, it has this really interesting phys physical property that ha it has uh, an S equals five ground state. Now, I can't go through all the details of this. Uh, chemists, when we have an electron, the electrons are usually paired to form bonds. But there are some times where the electrons unpair and you just have one. And then we say it has a spin. And the more unpaired electrons you have in a molecule, the more spin you have. And the more spin you have, the more you can use that for things like magnetic properties. And so we said, wow, that might be great. Well, now I want to talk about human serendipity. Okay, and this is where the studium comes in. I don't think anyone can go through and, and come up with a way of predicting blind luck, which is what I got when I got those crystals. Let me say, though, that other people had made metallic rounds 30 years before us. They just didn't notice. And that's where the prepared mind came in. Once I saw it, I said, you can use this in a predictive way to go through and make molecules. And as I say, we, we've made thousands, and there are many groups around the world that have now made thousands of additional metallic rounds by using uh, our approach. So I was collaborating with Talal Mala at the University of Paris Sacle now, it used to be Paris Sud, and he said, well, you know, the molecule you made here isn't any good for, for the process that we want, but I think it would be really good for another thing, and that's magneto refrigerants. Okay, so what's a magneto refrigerant? Well, you heard the other day how there were all these chlorofluorocarbons that uh, were in uh, refrigerators and how these could go through and destroy the ozone layer and whatever else. And basically the way your refrigerator works is you've got a compressor, it pushes gas in, that puts energy in, and then that piston comes back and the gas expands. And when it expands, it has to spread out, that takes energy, that cools the surroundings. And so this is, whoops, this is the modern way of, of cooling. But a more modern way that, we're going, that we have these days is to use magneto refrigeration. So what you do is you put some molecule or solid into a magnetic field that takes all those spins that I talked about and makes them all go in the same direction. That takes energy. It's making every single one of you turn towards me, not being in just different positions, okay? And so when that happens, that takes energy. But as soon as you remove the magnetic field, all of you decide to start turning around and doing different things. And in fact, what that ends up meaning is that takes energy and so you cool things. And so. Uh, we came up with something that could be a magneto coolant, and the reason why I have the space shuttle here is that NASA is very interested in molecules like this because out in outer space, you, need, you can't have a compressor that's doing this refrigeration with potentially toxic gases. You need to be able to compress gases uh, much more efficiently and cheaper. And it turned out that if you look at the numbers here, we were able to make molecules that were much smaller that were known, than were known um, that had equivalent types of behavior. So it turns out that these are magneto refrigerants. Okay, well I guarantee you I wasn't thinking about making magneto refrigerants at the time. So this is the molecule I've shown you. You put a metal here between an oxygen and a nitrogen. There's the link of nitrogen, oxygen I had wanted. It goes to another metal here, and then maybe you can put one here. 
If you make that into a ring, now you have the 12 metallic round four. And depending on how these atoms are arranged, you can make it into these 12 metallic round four structures or others, again, predictably. And this simply shows that if you look at lithium 12 crown four, which is the organic analog and the, the corresponding metal analog, when we look at all of the distances, they be, end up becoming very, very similar. And so that tells us that these really do, do in a structural way, behave like the crown ethers. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that you cannot stabilize hydroxylamine alone. I already told you that. But putting some other atoms around it allows us to make this stable structure. But because you have these other atoms around it, you can now build things off of these positions. And you see methyl groups and hydroxyl groups. You can change some of the atoms here. And right here you see stars. And whenever you see stars from a chemist, what it means is that they have a chiral molecule. So what's a chiral molecule? We were hearing about this the other day. I asked Jean-Pierre, can you get your rotor to go in only one direction? And he said, well, to do that, I'd have to do it with chirality. Chirality is handedness. If you take your left hand, you look at it, you put it over with your right hand, doesn't match. You can put it like this, but that's the wrong way, right? You can't superimpose one on the other. And you can try it this way and whatever else. And if you get really bored with my talk, you can, especially in the back, you can just start playing with that and see if you can go through and get your hands to, to overlap. They won't, okay? So that handedness is something biology uses to make proteins and DNA. It's something that chemists use all the time for their physical properties. Now, the problem is, I think I just lost my print. There it is. Okay. I like to do that as a joke. No. <laughs> I do it because I'm losing my mind. So here are the different molecules we can make, and you can make them all predictively. Okay, every single molecule that we made here, we made predictively. And you know, this is at a point where people, remember, not too far before this, people were saying this was just an artifact. This is crazy. Okay, and you know, let's talk about it. I'm I'm going to emphasize today the applications of these molecules, but I'm a chemist. And I care about chemistry. And it's important that chemistry also be done for the sake of chemistry. Just as Jean-Pierre talked about taking catenanes and rotaxanes and building structures, we care about how you put atoms together. Because if people want to be able to have properties that they can use in a productive way for science, we know, need to know how to do that. And so to be able to do that in a fundamental way is also important. And you can see here that that vanadium compound is a triangle. The 12 metallic round four is a square. Another molecule that we've made here is a 15 metallic round five. And we've gone through and made this with a vast variety of different things, following the topology type of approach that Jean-Marie Lane and Jean-Pierre Sauvage have both been very interested in. But of course, physical serendipity comes in, and so you can get these weird structures. Here's one we call a helicate. And you'll notice this has the same sort of topology as what Jean-Pierre talked about yesterday for two catenanes or for knotted molecules. And so you can do that as the inorganic analog of doing that. I want to emphasize the molecule which is over here. This is what is known as a fused metallocrown. It contains a lanthanide, and that lanthanide, those six lanthanides here, have a very interesting property. They're they lead to something which is called single molecule magnetism. So when I say single molecule magnetism, what do I mean? All, everybody has seen lodestone, I'm sure. Basically, the, the, the magnet that was discovered thousands of years ago that you could use for a compass. Okay? And the way that works is you have tens to hundreds of thousands of atoms all arranged with those spins that I talked to you about earlier randomly. Okay? They're in local regions ordered, but in the broad sense, they are random. Here is a molecule that George Christou made uh, back in the 1990s, and it has only 12 manganese atoms and about 50 overall. And so the question was, could you take a molecule that is like this and get the properties of one that's like this? 
So if we look at um, magnetite, what you get is random orientations of the spins. You put it in a magnetic field, they all go in one direction. That's what happens in your computer, right? That's what happens in your car. When you go click, 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 that's what's happening back and forth between being ori oriented and disoriented uh, in terms of the, the overall spins. What if you could do that with something with 100 atoms rather than something with 100,000 atoms? That revolutionizes how you have computers because rather than having to take a micron for a region to get one bit in your computer, and remember, we talk about, oh, that file is 30 megabytes. It's a 16 or 8-bit byte that goes into that 300 or 30 megabytes. So you need a lot of these if you're going to do this with magnetic storage, all right? So if you can make it smaller, and this is a way of making it smaller, you can start thinking about getting computers that are much smaller. When I started out in science, the first computer that I used at Berkeley up at a place called Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, the computer probably filled this room. That computer back in 1979 does, did not have the power of the computer that is sitting over there showing my projection. And that's because of miniaturization, miniaturization and electronic development. But in the future, we want to have more. And in the future, we're going to have quantum computers. Quantum computers no longer use this idea of a, of a binary system of ones and zeros. They use the fact that this electron or spin can see this spin and they can see it across the universe. And if you're interested in philosophy, we can talk about that later on. But they literally are thought to be able to see each other across the universe. But if you can arrange them in a molecule in such a way that they become quantum entangled, then rather than looking at zero or one, you can look at zero through one. And that changes the ability to do computations in a tremendous way. It makes, it, it just changed the world. So we are working on molecules that are like that to understand the primary physical properties of them. And I show you these graphs again. You don't need to know all the details. Just if you look at this, anybody can look at that and say that's not symmetric, okay? And this is exactly what we want. We're looking at how these spins go this way and that way. And you see that there's one region here where they, they go this way and that way in that particular way, and here, they do it differently. And that's exactly what you want for a qubit. You probably have heard about qubits if you read Scientific American or whatever. Qubits communicate with one another, and those qubits are what are gonna end up making quantum computers. Now, these molecules will not be quantum computers, but we are learning how to make molecules that will one day be quantum computers. So, now we're in molecular magnets. Let's look at a bunch of other compounds. Look at all those, all predicted except this one, serendipity, okay? That's a crazy looking thing, isn't it? You've got orange and purple and whatever around there. Let's, let's pretend like we're with a French chef where they do a deconstruction of a mille foie or something like that. If you take this molecule, you have a 12 metallic round four here, you have a 12 metallic round four here, now you have a 24 metallic round eight around it, and in the center, there's a lanthanide atom. This is the equivalent of a rotaxane, where the center is this. You have one of those rings that Jean-Pierre talked about yesterday, and then you have the capping sites here and here in a single molecule. This molecule is made in one step, okay? One step, you can literally, if you want to scale it up, get a gram of it, without any problem, um, it, it's absolutely amazing. And you throw it into solution, and it stays together, has a molecular weight of 3,500, and for the chemists to realize that a molecule of that weight held together with these sorts of bonds, that's truly amazing. So what I wanna end with in the last sort of sections here of the science is talking about luminescence. It will take me a few minutes to do this. We are interested in luminescent compounds and have been uh, with Stefan and Svetlana for over a decade now. Um, 
And one of the things that we've been looking at is lanthanide luminescence, and that's because they can have these very sharp signals. So what you do is you put light in, and that light usually is over in this part of the wavelength, and then out comes this other light, and you can see the different colors that you can get from these molecules. Um, and because these lines are so narrow, it allows us to do things that you can't do with organic molecules. The other thing is organic molecules, you've seen some of these fluorescent molecules, you shine light on it and very quickly they start decomposing because they get to an excited state, oxygen reacts with them and they go away. You can't decompose a lanthanide atom, it's an element. And so that means that these things end up being very resistant to photobleaching. And we are particularly interested in the near infrared spectrum because near infrared light goes right through you. If, I, if you were close enough, and you'll just have to believe Sophie, she can see some red in my finger. I if I, thank you. I do. <laughs> if we do this with green, okay, it, you will not see it if I had a green laser. Because green doesn't go through you, red does. And if you get to the infrared, then you can have the light go through you. And what that means is you can put one of these lanthanides into a person or an animal. If you can stimulate it, light will go right through the animal. It'll go right through your skull. And so if you need to, you can image a tumor in the brain right through the skull without cutting the person open. Right? So these are some of the hopes that we have for this. But the problem, one of the problems with these, is that it's very hard to stimulate lanthanides. And so you have to have what's known as an organic antenna. But remember, I told you we can put those organic molecules all around our, our metallic crown, and so we can change our antenna. And this shows that here is this metallic crown, and you can shine light on it for five hours. It doesn't budge. It is still as stable as it was before, but here is the photo bleaching associated with the organic molecule which means you can't do long-time assays with the organic molecule, but you can with ours. And this is some work that Ivana Martinich did when she was working as a graduate student with Svetlana and Stefan. And these are HeLa cells. HeLa cells are a type of cancer cell. So these are human cells. And the blue images that you see here come from our compound, the zinc-16 compound that you see here. So we're able to image it, and it goes to, the, to similar places as an organic dye, but this organic dye is the one that died in five minutes, uh, five hours, whereas ours, you could make a pathology cell and keep it for months and months and months. We also have made other molecules that look like this because they allow us to change the range. The, the molecules I just showed you with the zinc only emit here. These actually will emit across the entire spectral range that we're interested in, and it is far easier for us to modify these. So we can put antibodies that will go after a tumor. We can put molecules that will make them more water soluble. We can use them for magnetic resonance imaging or for a positron emission tomography. And here's an example where if you put iodine on them, we have what are called phantoms. So you should put light through, uh, uh, Guillaume Collet, who's in the audience, did this work. And you can see that this is one of the standard dyes that are used for contrast in, uh, if you have a computer tomography uh, image done, uh, iobitridol, I always hate pronouncing that one. Um, and you can see it is much lighter than what our metallic crown would be. And so in theory, you could use this not only for the light that comes out of the molecule, but you can also use it to absorb x-rays. That means you have a bimodal approach. X-rays are good for larger systems to tell you about bone structure, for example. Light is good to tell you about the very small areas. And everything that I've told you so far has been done with very small molecules. You'll hear a lot about nanoparticles and whatever, but those nanoparticles will probably be about a micron size, maybe a little bit less. And they can't go all the places that one of these molecules can go. But you can make them larger. Here are some of the dendromeric metallic crowns that we've made. Basically, this allows us to put large organic molecules. But dendromers are 
molecules that will transport things like RNA and DNA. We've heard about CRISPR earlier in the week, and you can use dendromers to move nucleic acids in and out of cells. But now, because we have in the center of these our lanthanides, in theory, you should be able to track these throughout the cell. Well, all of these results have led to a company that uh, uh, Frederick Lemoyne, Frank Susanet, Stefan Svetlana, and myself founded a little bit earlier here in Orléans called View Waves. Um, and we want to use this uh, in one of the first applications for the um, uh, image-guided surgery so that when a surgeon is going through and taking out tissue, they get all the cancer that they need to get, but they don't have to take good tissue. And that cuts down on side effects. As someone who has had prostate cancer and had to have surgery in this regard, I can guarantee you, you don't want the side effects of surgery if you don't have to and have any more tissue removed than is necessary. So here, what we have are all of these other agents that come out different approaches, all leading to this company, View Waves. Now, Lestudium has been really important in terms of doing all of this work that I've told you about. Here is a consortium, as I said, that was uh, supported by Lestudium that brought a bunch of us together. I'll point out Luis Carlos here. Here is David Needham. Here's Guillaume, who's in the audience, uh, and the other uh, characters you've already seen before. And through these conversations, we have been able to go through and do some really new, neat things, I, I'd like to believe. One of those neat things is, if you look at this mouse, we did not do these images, this is taken from this paper, um, you can measure the difference in temperature. And so, can you measure temperature differences? Can you measure temperature differences in tissue? Can you measure temperature differences in a cell? Can you measure it in an organelle? You can do, the, in theory, all of these things because our, our molecules, they go in where molecules can go. They're so small, whereas a lot of the nanoparticles that you hear about just can't do some of those types of things. And I'm sorry, I went through this too quickly. These are curves that tell us what the luminescence is. And so we can compare if we're interested in measuring in a microelectronic device at 150 Kelvin. Uh, where it might be uh, actually being worked at. We look at one of these. This is a terbium compound and how much light it emits. We take another compound over here that is red, and when we compare those two, we can do what's called ratiometric sensing that allows us to measure the temperature to within 0.1 Kelvin. So in theory, we could measure the temperature within 0.1 Kelvin in a human cell. That is where we want to go with this. Yesterday you heard a talk where I uh, was talking about hyperthermia and using that to treat cancer. Well, you want to take the cell up to 43 degrees. You do not want to take the area up to 45 or 46 because that will start killing all the other cells that are around it. So you need to have ways to measure temperatures for those systems. Um, and uh, one last thing I'll mention is we can make these into what are known as white light emitting molecules. And so by changing the types of ligands, we can move on a color spectrum. This is a way of telling whether something is white light or whether it's blue light or whether it's yellow light. And we can go from white to yellow with these. And so now you've got an application that takes you into making these sorts of molecules, these sorts of lights that you have here by doing spin coding. All of those things have been supported by Lestudium. If it hadn't been for Lestudium, we wouldn't have made this sort of progress. Now, maybe the referee was right, and I'm selling snake oil. <laughs> I hope not, <laughs> because I've told you we're going to help out in cancer. I didn't mention anything about hemorrhoids. But you know, the point being, that there are a lot of possibilities for these molecules. So if you were to go through and say, what does this look like? There's your linear process, right? We went from the metallic crowns in 1989 all the way, hopefully, in 2027 to 2030, using these in surgery to make people better. But that's not the truth. That's the truth, right? We started out with photosynthesis and siderophores. 
We ended up over here with metallic rounds and view waves. Fortunately for us, the studium was in the center to help us get there. All right. So let me just end with one future thing that we're doing that again comes from Le Studium by be, being able to be in France. I was down in Marseille and I had a conversation with a fellow who was working on volcanoes that are in the bottom of the ocean, 1.6 kilometers beneath the sea. And he heard my talk, the real scientific talk, not this talk, and he said, you know, your compounds look really good for something I discovered. And I said, what's that? He said, if you take these extreme thermophiles that live at these vents a mile below the ocean at incredible heat and whatever else, if you shine near infrared light on them, they start dividing. And I said, say what? He said, yeah, they start dividing. We don't understand why. And you know, people, they don't know whether we're heating the solution or whatever. So what we've done now is start a collaboration where we can take our metallic rounds and beads send it to this person, and he can literally take one cell in his microscope, put one of these beads next to it, shine light on, and start looking to see whether that can divide. So we're actually going back to the origins of life, since these are some of the oldest photochemical reactions, if they turn out to be true. And that sort of takes me back to where I started, as I was interested in photosynthesis, which was photochemistry. And so now I'm working back all the way through this, way, uh, this maze. Okay, unfortunately here there's a blockage, so I'm going to have to cut through it, but <laughs> to get back to photosynthesis. Now, for those people uh, who are uh, humanists, I hope I haven't left you in the maze. This is the maze at Shen and So. Just go over to Shen and So. There's a map on how to get out, and that will save you from, the, from this talk. But I want to end with a couple of points on the interdisciplinary nature of things, because I've talked about how science works. Now I want to talk in a slightly different way. This is us here in Orléans. All of these other dots you see here, these are collaborations that we have on metallic rounds. It is truly international. Now I think the international collaboration is good, helps people get to know one another, but really what you're talking about is diversity of thought. Right? There's this big thing in the United States where we all talk about how important diversity is. But we don't talk about why it's important. The why is because you look different. We're trained with a box around us. Okay? Like sometimes maybe that box has a martyr in front of it we have to look at. But there's a box in front of us. And by going and doing this interdisciplinary work, the box becomes bigger. We think about things we never would have thought of before. And this has certainly benefited me. The other thing I wanted to mention before we close are some of the younger people. Evan Trevedi was a postdoc. You see him here discussing science in Paris with Svetlana and Stefan and I a few years ago. He was the first person to actually run the Zinc 16 and see all the luminescence that came out of it. I sent him over here. Ivana was a student of uh, Svetlana's who came over to the United States and worked in my lab. When people go and go back and forth, they learn the experiments, they end up understanding how to do the experiments better. That's really important. But one of the things Studium has talked about is enhancing the visibility of science in the région centre, right? Well, that goes both ways. Oftentimes we think of bringing in scientists, all the people in this room who are very well known in their field, and that is showing something about Orléans. But it's important for the scientists here to be able to go out other places, especially the young scientists. I told the story of the referees earlier, half joking, and normally what I do is I say, young people realize I've done very well in my career. These are the sorts of lousy reviews <laughs> I got, people being very nasty towards me. If you feel like you have something that is going to work, go with it. Go with it. You have, to, you have to try as hard as you can with that work. The problem today is there aren't that many young people in this room, right? And Studium should be thinking about how to get young people in here and this cross-fertilization because I'll tell you in the sciences, I can't speak to the humanities, if you do not have people like Evan or Elvin 
having dinner here in Orleans during the consortium. One of my students who did all the nanothermometry, Ivana, you don't have a collaboration because I don't go in the lab and do anything. Stefan doesn't go in the lab and do anything. It's the students. It's the quality of the students and engaging students. And we need to do stuff more and more with them. And of course, another quote from Pasteur, a bottle of wine contains more philosophy than all the books in the world. And in fact, being able to make friends, to really get to the point where you know people and you can allows you to argue and then go over and have a glass of wine, that's how science is done. And Studium has allowed us to do that. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Congratulations. <laughs>